Good morning and welcome to the August AgriSampo uh, third Thursday marketing meeting. My name is Sterling Smith and I am director of ag research for AgriSampo. Brooke Shork will not be with us today as he's out in Maryland on some meetings. We're going to do a market overview today. We're going to talk about what's going on. We're also going to take a look at maybe some ideas going forward with the grain markets where things may go. We just had the August WASD on Monday and while it was bearish, it wasn't as bad as it could have been for some items. And uh, we do have a situation brewing with the soybeans and how much yields are going to be. So let's go ahead here and let's put up some charts and let's talk about what is actually going on. So this is a chart of new crop November soybeans. And as you can see, we have been really in a downdraft since May. Crop yields for this year right now are projected to be a little, be north of 52 bushels an acre. And uh, they raised them on the August WASD. The track record is when they get raised on the August report, they very often get raised again when we get, by the time we get to the January report. The rain over the last couple of days that we've seen across Nebraska and Iowa over the last uh, couple of nights has been highly beneficial. We picked up a lot of precipitation in the area. Soybeans are just coming into pod setting and getting rain at this time is ideal for crop development. So we are probably looking at a bigger yield for soybeans and we're going to be looking at a bigger crop, which means ending stocks are probably potentially going to go up another, I would say, 50 to uh, 100, which will create some market pressure. Along with that, though, we have gotten soybeans down to where they're very cheap. They are sub $10 now at 974. And as we look at the chart here and we look at both of these indicators, you can see that the market has become oversold. The best cure for low prices is, in fact, low prices. What I think we can see happen here is, one, the market won't be as sensitive to risk immediately with the South American crop. That's the next thing where we can get some bullish things going on, is if we see some weather problems, planting problems, development problems, that should spark a pretty good round of export sales, and that should work to lift the soybeans as we move into harvest, if we can get that to come into play. Along with that, interest rates have come down noticeably and they continue to come down, and that is pushing the dollar lower, which makes our grain cheaper. So we do have the potential here. I'm not saying we're gonna rally back to $11, but we do have conditions where the selling can at least abate a little bit, and there may be some potential to get some upside in here and get a little bit better of a foundation because Regardless, we are going to have burdensome ending stocks coming out of the United States, and that is going to move the risk into South America, and that's what we're going to need to pay attention to uh, really once we get past harvest. So that is where the next uh, next game is really going to be sitting. Moving on to the corn market. Much the same story here. We are looking at burdensome corn stocks. We're north of $2 billion which puts us in that bucket of, you know, bearishness. You know, if we see ending stocks south of about 1.4 billion, that's bullish. Between 1.4 and about 1.8, that's a little bit more neutral and we can get a bit of a trading market going on. We're north of 1.8 billion bushels. We have plenty of corn and there's no urgency to buy. What makes a market go up, if you think back to the, um, for initial invasion in the Ukraine, the wheat market went screamingly higher. It went to, you know, north of $12 a bushel. And there was a specific urgency to buy that drove the market higher. No one was willing to step in front of it. And that produced what historically you've now seen a price aberration because the wheat market is right back to where it was despite the ongoing situation. Right now with the corn market, there is not a lot of urgency to buy, which is a bearish problem. On the other hand, corn is now, you know, hovering right around this $4 area. There's not a lot of urgency to sell it either, at least right at the moment. We have some fairly heavy 
stocks on the farm and some of those are going to have to move and that can be a bit of a weight but by the same token we have corn that is now noticeably cheaper we may see fewer acres going in brazil for both corn and beans most likely for corn at least initially because most of their corn crop is planted as a second crop but they do plant some first crop corn that may be a little bit smaller and that may create enough tension again i don't think we can get screamingly bullish here we have big fun short positions we have seen a little bit of an improvement in export sales and hopefully that can continue to pick up so maybe we can't get bullish but maybe we can get rid of the bearishness that is i think the most reasonable expectation out of this unless something dramatically happens to change things a trade row with china would be obviously noticeably bearish by the same token if we see an improvement with the trade situation with china that is something that could help support prices one thing if you've been watching the export numbers and things if you look at those charts every week if you look at what our exports to mexico have been they are off the charts they are well well above uh what we have seen over the last five years and a continuation of that is something that would be supportive to prices so hopefully we have wrung most of the worst news out of it and now we may find ourselves in a holding pattern around this four dollar area until we can get some bullish news or you know hopefully not bearish news that's a possibility too but we do have some conditions here where we can at least bring some stability and maybe see prices move up a little bit let's talk about the wheat market <clears throat> and wheat prices you know we had a nice little bump a bump of hope in may on ideas that we were going to see you know some issues and some crops went in late etc and now we are holding you know this 550 area pretty well we have just finished up harvest on the kansas city wheat and that crop is a little bit better than anticipated minneapolis wheat is holding up very well Harvest for spring wheat is just starting. We're about, uh, maybe we've harvested a quarter of that crop. Yields for Minneapolis wheat are looking very, very good. We, in fact, may very well see some record yields for that. So supplies are going to be very good. The help that we can see and get for the wheat market is actually coming globally. Conditions for fr French wheat have been noticeably problematic, and uh, that is weighing on... Uh, their crop quality, and that's something where when people are looking for quality wheat, particular, particularly in Japan, uh, we may very well be, you know, the customer of better resort, and that can do something that can at least help support the wheat prices. Again, globally supplies are ample. There isn't anything here to drive this market dramatically higher, but there isn't a lot here to drive it dramatically lower either. We have fun short positions. Then most likely, if we can see the market move sideways, perhaps funds will have a new appetite for risk for some other things. And uh, that may serve to provide a few little bounces. Um, as far as, you know, upside, it's limited. It may very well be one of these things where it's very quick, where we see, you know, soybeans rally 15 or 20 cents over a couple of days and give it back for corn and wheat. Maybe we rally 10 or 15 cents and we slide right back. That is sort of the price action I'm looking for, certainly from now up until September 15th or so, when we start putting those South American crops in and we have something new to focus on. Hopefully we can get a little bit of worry going on and that's something that can work to support the prices here. Let's go ahead here. We're gonna talk about cotton next. and cotton prices the WASD for the cotton was less bearish than it had been we saw ending stocks get cut um, by about a million rolling bales which is beneficial but we're still at a very elevated number the cotton market is struggling much like uh, clothing retailers are in that demand for clothing is not returned to pre-pandemic levels and it may be a quite a while before we get there simply with the work at home situation fashion is out of fashion and it's remaining that way 
until something comes along to change that, uh, the cotton market most likely is going to continue to struggle with some demand issues. Uh, exports have been okay to China, but they've been nothing to write home about. Again, we have another big fund short position in an oversold market. If we were to see some weather issues, cotton conditions are not as stellar as they are for corn and soybeans. Corn, soybeans, and Minneapolis wheat, when we looked at the crop condition report that came out on Monday, these were amongst the best we have ever seen. And we are now, it's the middle of August. We're starting to draft fantasy football teams, things like that. It's at the point on the calendar where it's going to be very hard to take much out of that soybean crop. We can still put something into it. I'm not saying the corn crop is absolutely set where it is, um, but again, we're at that point where doing damage is going to get harder and harder with each passing day. And the rain that we saw move through this week um, is going to certainly leave a lot of that tension and pressure, particularly in areas in eastern Nebraska and moving across to Iowa that picked up some very good rains. So with cotton, again, I think, you know, 65 is probably your floor. Moving north of 70 is probably going to be something that's going to attract sellers unless there's something to change in the conversation to propel this market higher. So we're going to deviate. Usually we just talk about the grain markets today, and Brooks and I talk about cash prices and things like that. And we covered that pretty thoroughly on the WASD. We're about to have a bunch of grain coming into the market. So, you know, there's probably going to be some basis issues. And again, head on a swivel and pay attention. If you get an opportunity where you see some good basis, don't be afraid to grab it. Because again, prices are going to be heavy and we're going to have harvest pressure coming in. So let's talk about the cattle market. The cattle market right now is a tale of two woes. We have cutout prices, which is the price that wholesalers use to determine retail prices. Those have been staying north of $3 a pound. And that has worked to help keep packer margins uh, further out of the red for where we are for the last few days. Packer margins for this entire year for producing beef have been negative, meaning they're losing money on every cow they slaughter. That is not a good way to run a railroad. But Tyson reported record earnings because they're making more money, you know, on their pork and on their chicken to offset those losses in cattle because consumer demand for pork and chicken have been higher because they're cheaper. And we're seeing consumers on the lower end, let's say we fully looked at the bottom quartile of, of consumers, they're beginning to get pinched economically and they're forced to take on more bargains. So they are buying less beef and they're buying more chicken, throwing more pork in the shopping cart, which is something that's weighing on prices. So how the cattle market is going to resolve itself? Right now, we have fairly tight supplies, and we're seeing fairly expensive cattle. Cash cattle right now is trading at 187, 188 in the south to maybe 195 in western Nebraska. If you look at the futures, we're trading at 181, so we are trading at a deep discount. This market has recovered from a pretty good shake. This drop that we see here on the chart actually occurred when we had the sell-off in the stock market last week. And that uh, always makes cattle prices jittery. So we've been kind of climbing the wall of worry. And the chart actually looks a lot like the chart of the S&P 500. Cattle prices are probably going to be caught in a trap here if the consumer cannot continue to pay up, meaning that upper bucket consumer can't drive cutout prices higher. We're going to have to see a resolution with that, and we're getting to the point where we may very well see uh, cattle prices fall simply because the uh, packers have cut down on their slaughter numbers noticeably on the idea that they can simultaneously drive up prices in the store while driving cattle prices down. If they find that they're pushing on a string and can't push prices up in the store, they're going to be forced to pay uh, less for cattle. Our cattle owners are going to be forced to move the cattle simply because they can't continue to hold them in a falling market. So once we get past summer grilling season here, I do expect to see some volatility in the cattle market. Moving on to the hog market. Hogs have seen their BLT trade every summer, 
And Brooks likes to joke about this, but this, um, you know, this is something to pay attention to because this is something that has worked. I'm not a, necessarily a heavy believer in seasonal ideas, but this is something that works in that you get a demand for uh, first for the pork and then for the bellies as we come into July and August due to the heat. And that produced this run up and we had a very nice little bounce here. Belly prices are staying a little bit firm, but they're well off their highs. And that began this little corrective phase. The market may have a little bit more upside to work here, depending on what belly prices do. But normally the second half of August is a bad period for pork prices in general, a very bad period of time for belly prices. So we may very well uh, see some pressure be able to move into the hog market. And if we look, hogs are a different market. We see a deep discount. If you look at December, hogs are trading 12 cents a pound below where the October prices is. Don't construe that as bullish contango. Okay, we're going to see more hogs coming to market in August because of the farrowing cycle within the hogs. So uh, as far as inflation relief goes, I think we can be looking at the hog market and the uh, probably the beef market providing us with a little bit of relief as we come into the grocery store. And let's go ahead here and let's go ahead and talk about crude oil, energy prices, and what's going on in the broader world. As you can see, crude oil prices have been an up and down market. We produced a very nice low, which also corresponds pretty much to the shakiness we saw on Wall Street. Uh, the market has since bounced about $4 a barrel, and we're holding a pretty good range between 72 and 82. Economic worries are keeping the market a little bit softer than maybe it would be normally. Some of this is U.S. numbers. More of this, though, are more concerns about Asia demand and things coming out of the U.S. This is being offset by the global issues that we see going on in China. and Or, excuse me. Uh, the economic issues in China, but the problems in the Middle East are the bullish side, meaning the situation in Iran and what Hezbollah is going to do to respond in this battle between them and Israel. We are The world is still waiting on a response from Hezbollah. We have not gotten that response yet. And perhaps diplomacy has worked or Hezbollah has determined that maybe an overzealous response might prove to be a little bit problematic and they're not going to do it. The issue is, is Russia is a big oil exporter. We have Ukrainian troops now fighting inside of Russia and that incursion is something that could be a threat to global oil supplies and that Russia could curtail them. Uh, we could see damage to infrastructure and things of that sort. So that is supporting the bullish side of the market. U.S. demand for crude oil remains fairly stout and if neither of these global issues come to fruition, I think seeing a range between 70 and 80, 72 to 82 uh, for the coming months is probably a fairly reasonable uh, thing to look at. Looking at the components here, if we take a look at diesel and jet fuel, diesel has been an underperformer. Uh, as you can see, if you look at the crude oil charts, yes, they look similar, but you don't see the magnitude in the same bounce. We have seen diesel supplies increase. We have seen diesel demand back off. Some of this may be economic slowing. Some of this may be just continued realignment coming out of the pandemic, meaning we are moving more to services. We have moved away from the revenge travel and you know, everyone's bought all the furniture they need, everything of that sort, and that's naturally working to weigh on diesel prices a little bit. So there's also some global issues uh, with China not being as economically stout and struggling to figure out what they need to do to uh, get things moving forward again. Looking at gasoline prices, these have uh, also kind of underperformed crude oil. Gasoline demand has been a little a little shaky, but it's been okay. Year over year demand growth for gasoline in the US has flatlined and it's been that way pre-pandemic and that's something that's going to be an ongoing concern. Newer cars are more economical, younger people drive less, uh, electric cars, small factor, hybrids a small factor. But again, we've leveled off and this will continue to correlate more with crude oil, more than seeing any big jumps in demand uh, coming into the U.S. 
moving on to natural gas, which this is something we need to be concerned about, as this is a direct correlation with um, fertilizer prices. Natural gas prices have recovered. We had, you know, some ideas that we were going to have a hot summer when we didn't get too much of a hot summer. I mean, we had two or three weeks of miserable heat here in Nebraska, but that was really about it. After that, temperatures were normal and sometimes below normal. And in fact, after we got through with our heat blast here two weeks ago, we had noticeably subnormal temperatures. In fact, lows at night approaching 50 degrees, which is a little bit different. We're starting to see natural gas move up. And uh, yes, it's time to start thinking about winter and seeing winter uh, builds. Natural gas is cheap right here. And I think there's people willing to come in here and buy natural gas. One on concerns about hurricane risk. Right now, we don't have anything. Hurricane Ernesto is expected to stay well off the Atlantic coast. So that doesn't represent a risk to energy assets. But if you watch the DMOs, I've put in maps where the energy assets are and where the where the storms are, so we can always be aware of what's going on, because this can certainly affect the price of fertilizer, but natural gas has come in so much from what we've seen. Hopefully, there won't be too big of an effect. Well, everybody loves gold. Farmers love silver, but we're going to talk about gold because silver can be a little dangerous to trade. We've seen gold prices continue to move higher. It used to be the thinking that inflation was gold's favorite food, and that's what drove gold up. That's not necessarily true. What really drives gold up is it's the anti-dollar, meaning if you think the dollar's going lower, owning gold is a very viable choice because it doesn't give you the same risk as, say, owning euro currency or a package of other currencies. You're not taking on any of that risk. You're taking something that is directly correlated inversely with the dollar. There are a lot of ideas that we are going to see gold move higher. I've heard major investment banks, uh, a lot of talking heads on TV think we're going to be able to drive gold higher. Markets are very, very smart. I think gold can go higher. I don't think we're going to go as high as people think, simply because the market is forward looking. We know we're going to see interest rate cuts. Question of how many and how fast is going to be priced into these currency markets very quickly. But a topside breakout in gold is possible, and we could see that in silver get drug higher. With that, we'll go ahead and talk about the dollar here. And the dollar has been, well, choppy is really a good way to describe it. We were, we were lower, you know, 10 months ago, managed to go a little bit higher. Now we've ground lower. One thing that I do see here, this pattern over the last three days, get you a little bit about technical analysis. This is called a goalpost. See, it looks like you should be able to kick a football through it unless you're a Nebraska Cornhusker, in which case that just doesn't happen. If we see higher trade tomorrow, this can be a very reliable signal that we're going to push higher. If we do not see higher trade tomorrow, this can become a bearish signal pretty quickly. We don't have a lot of big news for the next week driving interest rates. We had the PPI and CPI numbers this week. The PPI came out cooler than expected. What that is is the producer price index. That is a measure of wholesale inflation. That is ideas about inflation going forward. And when that cools off, that means everything through the supply chain is getting a little cheaper or not going up in price as much. We had CPI yesterday. That was also a little bit cooler than expected, coming in at about 3%. So we are getting a handle on the inflation situation as supply chains have fully normalized. And we've seen some of the froth that was in the economy begin to work itself off. This does not mean that prices are going back to 2019 levels. Okay, we just need to realize that yes, what the McDonald's meal costs now is what it's going to be costing. We are not going to see prices go back to those levels unless we have a severe, and I do mean severe recession. So keep that in mind that there's a new pricing paradigm and this is normal with inflation. We raise the floor, we have raised the floor on everything. And that barring 
any big changes or big shifts is something that is not just going to evaporate. That is something, as long as the economy stays reasonably healthy, which is basically you can define that as low unemployment, that those prices are not going to come back. But basically, hopefully, sending back inflation means we stop the rise in prices. And interest rates. Interest rates have come down considerably from their April peak. This is a 10-year. We were trading at about 460. Our major peak, we touched 5% 5, 5 ever so briefly, and we've since seen prices come down. <clears throat> Given a small bump up in unemployment and the easing of the inflation numbers, we should expect the Fed to cut rates. And uh, there is the Jackson Hole meeting, which is sponsored by the Kansas City Fed, that will be the next big piece of information until the next Fed meeting, and that will be going on a week from today. And Chair Powell will have some things to say. I don't think he's going to change his tune very much. The real question is, are we going to get a 25% basis cut? Are we going to get a 50% basis cut? And how quickly they're going to go on. Chair Powell has said he's going to be data dependent as long as unemployment doesn't spike up. We can probably expect 50 on the first go around, then slow drops back to somewhere around two and a half to three percent. If unemployment or GDP numbers or there's some sort of shock to the economy, he will take things down quicker. The prospect of rates going up is going to go away in a hurry. And this is good news with the tenure at three, uh, three spot nine one. Things like mortgages are going to get cheaper. Those spreads are going to tighten. Things like operating loans are going to get tighter. So we should expect to see some improvement in the cost of money, and uh, that's generally beneficial to all. And I'm going to take one quick look at the stock market here. And uh, after that, we'll be finishing up. So this is a chart of the S&P 500. As you can see, we had a volatility problem uh last week and we uh we beat the market up pretty good this was an unwind of the japanese yen carry trade i'm gonna kind of make this as simple as i can what has been going on for the last 25 years with japan having interest rates near zero is if you're a hedge fund manager you borrow yen. you are now short yen so you have a natural hedge against your position you're borrowing these yen at basically zero interest or very, very low interest rates. And you're taking this money and you're buying treasury bonds, you're buying stocks, you're buying NVIDIA, you're buying commodities, whatever you are, and you're buying it very cheaply because you have access to this easy money. And we're doing this in the trillions of dollars. Well, the Bank of Japan, after 25 years of not raising rates, actually raised their interest rates and you can't borrow money for free anymore. So that creates a bit of a snowball effect and like a cork out of a bottle. All of a sudden there's some forced selling and that tips into each other. And that creates this volatility spike that we had that really sent, uh, sent the market into a great deal of turmoil. And it also sent the financial press into a great deal, deal of turmoil. Now, if we look including today's action, we've almost fully recovered. So I'm of two minds here. If we can't take out the old high, we may be having a problem. If we can take out that old high, we may very well be on our way to noticeably higher equity prices. And that's going to depend, A, on earnings, and B, on how healthy the American consumer stays and how low unemployment stays. If you mix not too much of a rise in unemployment along with dropping interest rates, that's a very good formula for stocks. And we're going to close things out today with a look at the VIX. This is a measure of volatility. And as you can see, volatility went up. And we're going to take this all the way back to the pandemic. So as you can see, the VIX, which is a measure of volatility, spiked right here during the pandemic. That corresponded exactly with the market low in the pandemic, which produced a very noticeable rally. This was the spike from our little incident on Monday, which also appears to correspond with a low and volatility has since normalized very quickly. So that is working to calm some nerves 
And again, the market will be data dependent, but as things in Europe continue to slog and the formula for the US is actually pointing to probably a reasonably good environment for the equity markets. Ashley, did we have any questions? I do not see any. Well, with that being the case, I'm not gonna take any more of anybody's time on this lovely Thursday. Feel free to share this with anybody you like. If you have any questions, certainly feel to reach. Feel free to reach out. I'm happy to answer anything uh, that you have. And if I don't have an answer handy, I can certainly hunt one down for you. Thank you and have a great day.